Hi, this is Dr. Bernstein with our March 2017 edition of our teleseminar. Uh, before we start, I want to give you the usual warning that uh, my answers to your questions are merely guesses because I don't have your full medical history. I have not examined you and uh, it's really quite impossible to give accurate answers to personal questions under those conditions. Uh, therefore, these teleseminars are for general information for all of the listeners, not really to solve the problem of an individual listener. Um, uh, our special subject for today is to mention uh, a new product that recently came on the market that I'm very enthusiastic about. It's a new lancet for sticking fingers. It looks just like the old ones. I'll show it to you. Uh, here it is. No different in appearance, but has two particular features that are unique. One is that experiments were conducted to uh, arrive at the right gauge of wire to use for the lancets and also to, to work out the right angle uh, that would be least painful, uh, yet would not dull readily. Remember, one, most lancets are designed to be thrown away after one use. So they get dull, they get hooks, and so on. This lancet not only has the right combination of angle and gauge, but it also has been annealed. That is, the steel has been heat treated uh, to make it uh, less likely to, uh, for the tip to be injured. So it lasts for multiple uh, finger sticks or wherever you stick and uh, is the closest thing to painless that I've uh, yet experienced. Uh, first question, how important is blood glucose reading one hour after a meal? Should I just ignore it even if it is very high as long as Two hour post meal reading is a reasonable number. Well, I have a theme that I keep repeating over and over, and that is that uh, diabetics are entitled to the same blood sugars as non diabetics. And the implication is uh, that uh, if a non diabetic eats a reasonable meal, uh, a, a diabetic should have the same blood sugars as the non-diabetic. And most non-diabetics on traditional meals, not modern high carbohydrate meals, most non-diabetics on traditional meals don't have blood sugar elevations. They stay pretty much constant. Uh, and uh, that's what we should experience. Uh, the higher your blood sugar, the more the, the hazards over the long term. And even if it's only for a few hours uh, after each meal, it adds up over time. Now, most doctors don't agree with this. The ADA is very much opposed to this. And as you know, they recommend very high carbohydrate diets, knowing that they're going to get very high blood sugars after meals and maybe even for most of the day. What is, what is your view on a limited carb diet during pregnancy? Well, there's no reason why pregnant women should be exposed and fetuses should be exposed to high blood sugars. So it's essential to have uh, a very limited carb diet during pregnancy. In fact, uh, Many studies have been reported by Lois Jovanovich, MD, uh, over the years, over the past probably 40 years, showing that women who have normal blood sugars during pregnancy uh, do not get the uh, fetal uh, malformations and other complications that are so common in diabetic pregnancies. Um, uh, and she puts her women on low carb, low carb diets, very low carb diets. So this is essential for a safe pregnancy. 
And I might add that when I've seen my patients uh, put in the hands of obstetricians who insisted upon ADA diets, I've seen disasters occur. Uh, could you suggest an alternative to soy flour as my doctor suggested I limit soy or any other suggestions for people with thyroid issues? Well, we know that um, uh, unfermented soy can affect the absorption of uh, thyroid hormone from tablets and uh, can also affect the uh, behavior of deiodinases. So, um, uh, yeah, if you have thyroid problems and maybe in general, it's not a good idea to overload on unfermented soy products. And for in so far as flour goes, the only thing I was able to think of offhand would be almond flour. There may be others that I don't know of, but certainly almond flour would be a good substitute. Uh, next question. Diagnosed type one a month ago, his tests, I guess this is a son, his tests showed he has very little beta cells. He has allergy to raw fruits, vegetables, peanuts, legumes, and beans. Cooked vegetables make him sick. How do you, how do we get more micronutrients into his diet? Well, uh, first of all, you might want to try uh, other nuts than peanuts. For example, pistachio nuts, macadamia nuts, almonds, uh, all the while uh, uh, counting the carbohydrate and keeping it uh, in low limits. Uh, in my book, Diabetes Solution, we have a list of benign vegetables, benign in terms of uh, carbohydrate content, and there are probably at least 30 vegetables on the list, uh, including many I've never seen. Uh, and uh, you could try them one at a time either cooked or uncooked, and uh, see how re he responds to them. So the book Diabetes Solution would be helpful. Can you explain the Dawn effect and how best to manage blood sugars with this problem? Well, the Dawn phen uh, phenomenon has been described in my book, Diabetes Solution. It's, we also have a video on it on Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes University. So uh, it shouldn't be necessary for me to again talk about it. It's a lengthy discussion and the video on this subject is uh, excellent. Uh, if a person has hypoglycemia and is not diabetic, is there risk for becoming a, a diabetic higher than normal? Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, reactive hypoglycemia uh, is very frequently a precursor to diabetes. Uh, so people who, um, there are people who will eat something sweet, their blood sugars will shoot up and then plummet downward. And uh, that's uh, a good predictor of um, a fair chance of developing diabetes, usually type two diabetes. How as a parent of a type one diabetic do I get my 14 year old son to understand that letting his sugar go to 329 and not doing anything about it uh, for several hours will cause long-term problems? Well, um, you should explain to him the long-term complications of diabetes. There becomes a time in a kid's life when he has to know the score. Uh, mostly patient, parents hide this information from their kids, but they do get to an age where they have to be told the truth, that this disease, if poorly controlled, is not only a fatal disease, but a disease that causes many 
physical problems that can be painful and agonizing in many respects. And um, the only way we're out of it is to have normal blood sugars. Now, um, uh, if you um, visit uh, on the internet type 1 grit, G-R-I-T, you'll probably come up across uh, some articles that show the damage to the brains of children who have been exposed to high blood sugars and also damage the brains of adults who are chronically exposed to high blood sugars. Um, uh, so not only are things like kidneys and eyes um, uh, and reproductive organs affected by high blood sugars, but even the brain is seriously damaged by elevated blood sugars. And the brains of uh, kids who have had high blood sugars for many years are smaller, their IQ, IQs uh, go down, and uh, a number of problems occur in the brain. Uh, and this information may be documented on type 1 grid. I may have had uh, some of these articles uh, presented on some of my Diabetes University videos, but I'm not sure. Are the antioxidants in berries worth any raise in blood sugar? I would say absolutely not. Um, I haven't had berries in uh, at least 50 years, I guess, um, since 1969. So that would be 48 years. And uh, I'm in better shape than most non-diabetics who are 10, 15 years younger than me. So I, I don't know what those antioxidants would have done for me. Uh, there are also potential hazards to antioxidants. What's the best way to lighten coffee besides using half and half? Half and half is half cream, half milk. Well, the best way would be heavy cream, which is what I use. Uh, there are several advantages. One is that uh, it turns out to be cheaper because you use less, less of it because it has more lightning power. The other is that it tastes better. And the third is that uh, it has uh, one third the carbohydrate content of milk. So uh, it has less carbo. What is more important, glycemic index or glycemic load? These are two uh, indices that have been used to generate misinformation. The glycemic index uh, is a measure of the amount that a certain food will um, raise blood sugar in a non-diabetic compared to uh, uh, bread, which by the way raises blood sugar more than uh, pure glucose. Um, so they take a ratio of the blood sugar increase in a non-diabetic, but most non-diabetics, especially with the small amounts of food that they use in, in checking the glycemic index, non-diabetics not going to show much of a blood sugar increase. Yet, with a very small amount of uh, the foods that they're testing, I will show a huge blood sugar in the, uh, increase because I'm diabetic. So, uh, where peanuts supposedly have a very low glycemic index of 15%, uh, a bag of peanuts will raise my blood sugar by something like 200 milligrams per deciliter, which is a huge amount, even though they say it has a low glycemic index. So it's a meaningless number when it comes to diabetics. And glycemic load uh, is a, a measure of the total carbohydrate in a product, uh, I believe unrelated to blood sugar, um, so all you have to do is look at the total carbohydrate content 
and uh, you don't have to uh, look at a number that's uh, been calculated by different formulas by different people. Are there any vitamins or supplements that you recommend to help in reducing my A1C from 66 to 5.3 percent. Um, uh, as I say over and over, there's no magic in the treating of diabetes. There are uh, no supplements that really have a significant effect. Well, I can retract that. There, there are two, but there are potential problems. Uh, one is fenugreek, which um, uh, is widely used in Israel and maybe in several other countries in that part of the world. And these seeds, um, if you use the pure fenugreek, you stink to high heaven and the whole area around you will stink. Uh, but I understand they now have uh, de-stinkified fenugreek and uh, that may be available and it may have some effect on blood sugars. I don't know about side effects or adverse effects. Um, there's also um, uh, a metal, and I forgot the name of it, which has been shown to um, lower blood sugar by inhibiting phosphatase, which is an essential enzyme that uh, uh, occurs throughout the body. Uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the metal. Uh, it's sold as a salt of the metal. Um, in any event, I can't remember it offhand. The trouble is uh, that it should probably be avoided because it inhibits an enzyme that's essential for many chemical reactions in the body and therefore could be hazardous. Um, I don't know of other supplements that uh, will significantly affect blood sugar. And of course, there's nothing that affects it as much as a low carbohydrate diet, which may not be enough. You may need medications beside. Please mention the names of the meters you say are the most accurate. Well, uh, we, I, I've been using now for a year or two the Freestyle Freedom and the Freestyle Freedom Light, which are identical except in, in uh, size, battery usage, and uh, uh, minor differences. Um, there's uh, uh, another meter that we are uh, testing right now that looks pretty good. Uh, it's called the Contour Next One, O-N-E. Here's, here's the device. Um, it, uh, it may be just as accurate, but it requires twice the amount of blood. And for many of us, uh, many diabetics have Raynaud's phenomenon and don't bleed that easily from finger sticks. Uh, so it's important to us to uh, not require a lot of blood. Recently diagnosed type 2 with an A1C of 9.7% was put on metformin 2,000 milligrams a day and Galvis 50 milligrams. By the way, Galvis is a mixture of vitagliptin, which is an, a, an SGL2 inhibitor and metformin. So it's a mixture of two drugs. And this, th this patient's doctor is giving her both a mixture of metformin and vitagliptin plus additional metformin. Um, why, I don't know. Uh, this whole class of drugs has potential hazards associated with it. Uh, it uh, they work by... Um, causing you to, well, by lowering the renal th threshold for glucose so that the kidneys pee away glucose at lower blood sugars than you'd usually expect. So instead of peeing them away, 
at a blood sugar of 170, you might be peeing glucose away at 130, thereby lowering your blood sugar, but also increasing your risk of urinary tract infections and also increasing your risk of dehydration. Anyway, getting back to the question, on low carb diet, my fasting is in low 70s and after meals in low 80s. Should I ask my doctor to stop the metformin or the galvis? Well, I would stop the galvis and see what happens. Um, simply, be, if only because it has the potential for adverse effects. Um, my daughter has type one doing low carb diet for two years. LDL is 150. I heard that only one to 2% of diabetics will have an increase in LDL while on a low carb diet. Do you know anything about this and do you have a solution? Well, I no longer look at LDL because many studies have shown it not to be a risk factor for anything. Um, the risk factors for heart disease uh, are more related to inflammation like uh, C-reactive protein, um, uh, fibrinogen, which is also related to blood clotting, um, especially lipoprotein small a, and there are a number uh, of factors that are uh, far more likely to be related to heart disease than LDL. So I just don't worry about it. And uh, I don't think that I've tested mine for maybe uh, 30 years or so. Uh, and back when I was testing it, it was an experimental test. I was one of the first people to uh, use it, but it turns out the literature shows is of very little value. How often do you inject yourself on an average day? Um, well, if I eat three meals, I'll have a shot for each meal and a shot of um, traceba on a rising, a shot of traceba on bedtime. So that, it's, that means at least five shots a day. Um, if I need a correction, I'll take another shot uh, for that correction. Now, uh, because I'm getting gamma globulin, as I, exp I explained in my book, I'm at higher risk for hypoglycemia and um, uh, that, exp that makes it, uh, makes my blood sugars a bit harder to control than before I started getting gamma globulin. So I might on average get one extra shot a day, which would be uh, six shots if I have three meals. Uh, unfortunately, I'm so busy with my medical practice that I rarely get a chance to eat lunch uh, during the week. And then on weekends when I go to the gym, uh, I likewise uh, never get a chance to eat lunch. So I'm stuck with two meals a day and uh, therefore get four shots plus maybe an extra one for a correction. My daughter has had type one diabetes for 10 years A1C of 6.8%, which is an average of 172 milligram per deciliter, uses only human, humulin R with steady uh, blood sugar. MD wants her on basal lantus. Uh, your comments. Ah, wait, this daughter has not had type one for 10 years. She's 10 years old. So she's a new type one and indeed there may be value to basal lantus uh, to help keep her blood sugar steady, but um, uh, I would much prefer uh, an insulin that doesn't bring with it the risk of cancer like lantus does. So I would prefer Traceba, which is easier to use, uh, gives steadier, more level blood sugars too. So he might want to consider a small dose of Traceba. Uh, you can only uh, get it in one unit shots in a Traceba pen. Um, I'm not, uh, and there are, the vials are available separate from the pen. So you can draw Traceba into 
uh, an insulin syringe and get half unit doses. Um, so I would try that rather than Lantus. Um, how dangerous are the preservatives such as uh, creosol uh, and insulin? Which one is the safest? Well, I don't even remember which insulins have which preservatives. The amount that's put in them is very minute. I haven't heard of any adverse effects from the from the preservatives. Um, so I, I don't. I think this is uh, a non problem. I might add that um, the smell of most insulins uh, to me resembles formalin, which is also used as a preservative. Is 6, 12, and 12 carbs healthy for a five-year-old weighing 60 pounds? with a high level of ketones over urine and a blood sugar of 166. Well, 166 is pretty darn high and certainly not good for the uh, growing brain of a five-year-old child. Uh, and 6, 12, and 12 is probably double the amount of carbohydrate that she should be getting. Um, uh, I came up with a 6, 12, and 12 for an adult and uh, uh, it, and if you if you read my book Diabetes Solution, you'll realize that it should be reduced in proportion to body weight. So we use six, twelve, and twelve for say a hundred and forty pound adult, and for a kid who weighs um, let's say thirty five pounds, it would be a quarter of six, twelve, and twelve. So that would be very little carbohydrate. I'm a low carb type one with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Cheese sends my blood sugar up. Well, cheese will send the blood sugar of any type one diabetic up. In fact, any food will raise your blood sugar. Uh, this person uh, probably has not read my book, Diabetes Solution, uh, or, or he or she would realize that for type ones, any food will raise blood sugar and you have to cover them with insulin. One ounce of cheese can increase my blood sugar by 20 milligrams per deciliter. That's probably about right. Uh, in fact, that's about what one ounce raises mine. Uh, what causes this? Is this possibly a casein reaction or allergy? I don't experience gastric upset. You absolutely should read my book, Diabetes Solution. Uh, this is caused by two things. It's caused by gluconeogenesis, because with inadequate insulin, we convert protein to glucose. Uh, we even convert our own muscles to glucose. And um, uh, the other factor is uh, the GLP-1 effect, which is described in my book, where uh, a di type one diabetic could eat pebbles and just by distending his gut, his blood sugar would go up. Next question, have you ever heard of using sodium bicarbonate and molasses in hot water for improving blood sugars? I never heard of it, but it's a, uh, it's a very nice way of killing diabetics. Type one for 18 years, control good until I became hypothyroid. I believe I am developing gastroparesis and overnight sugars are high when I test in the morning. And when I take extra insulin at night, I wake up dangerously low, confused, willing to try anything. And yet another person who should read my book, Diabetes Solution. Now it's interesting that I conduct my teleseminars, or I initially conducted them, uh, to answer questions that were not answered in my book. 
But as things turn out, most of the questions uh, would have been answered if the uh, listeners had read my book. And um, uh, I'm not, certainly not going to go into the details of the dawn phenomenon or gastroparesis right now. They're covered very thoroughly in the book. How important is LDL particle size? Well, according to the scientific literature, it's more important than total LDL, but of in the modern literature of uh, relatively small significance. So um, uh, much more interested in looking at things like coronary artery calcium score, which is an imaging study, and at um, uh, 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 immune factors, factors that um, relate, that reflect inflammation, as I've said before. These are much more potent. Uh, in fact, it's been discovered that the effect of statins on increasing life stems not from the fact that they reduce LDL, um, but from the fact that they reduce inflammatory markers, they reduce inflammation. And therefore, uh, the implication is that it's likely that other um, medications that reduce inflammation uh, and are safer than statins uh, might be more appropriate for uh, preventing heart disease. Now, you have to watch out when you get to anti-inflammatory medications because you may get, you may, uh, get involved with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs which have a host of their own adverse effects and uh, should not be chronically used. Next question. Mother has type 2 diabetes and is close to being placed on dialysis. After reading your studies and watching videos, it seems like she may be getting bad information from her doctor. What type of questions should we be asking our doctors if we're unsure about their recommendations without telling them how to do their jobs? <laughs> well, first of all, what's the status of her blood sugar control? Uh, if no one is attempting to keep normal blood sugars, you can be sure that she's going to go down the tube, down the tubes, and um, the higher her blood sugars, the more rapidly, and the lower her creatinine clearance or glomerular filtration rate, the more rapidly she's going to go down the tubes. Those two factors are the key factors. So um, uh, you certainly should know, you should ask them what her glomerular filtration rate or GFR is, um, if it is under 10, the chances are she's going to need to go on dialysis pretty soon. If it's under five, uh, she'll certainly need dialysis soon. If it's over 15, there's a good chance that it can be postponed. And recent studies have shown that the longer you postpone dialysis without causing harm, uh, the longer these patients live. And the longer their kidneys last. Why? I don't know, but that's what the recent scientific literature shows. So she certainly should ask what their GFR is, what her GFR is. Can successful dream, can Stressful dreams cause elevated morning blood sugars. That's a, ver a very interesting question, and I don't know the answer. Um, I have had stressful dreams and have not, not frequently, but uh, uh, there were periods in my life when I was exposed to a lot of dream, a lot of stressful dreams, and I was under a lot of daytime stress, and. Um, I don't remember them affecting my blood sugars, but uh, that's only one person. I just don't know. Type one for 19 years. 
on Victoza for one and a half years. I love it, even though I don't need to lose weight. It helped reduce the feeling of wanting to eat uh, all of the time and blood sugar slightly more stable. Well, this is why we use it. I use it to curb overeating. Uh, its effects have worn off. Any suggestions how to restart the positive effects of Victoza? Um, now, I've been told to take time off and restart. Well, uh, this is what we've found with most patients, namely that uh, the GLP-1 agonist, actually many substances that curb overeating, uh, we found to wear off over time, not for everybody, but for many people. And what we do is try substituting an alternate substance. And then uh, even another alternate substance when the second one wears off. Uh, and then eventually go back to the first substance. So uh, I have rotated patients on Victoza, Bieta, Amelin, uh, and uh, with some degree of success. Uh, with many patients, the rotation works. With other patients, it doesn't work. Uh, sometimes I will jump to a totally different substance. So, for example, uh, I have several people who were controlled on Victoza or Bieta, and uh, 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 they're no longer working and uh, rotating uh, stopped working. So we've tried Bauhinia and uh, other substances. Um, so it's a matter of trial and error. And we do mention this uh, in my book, Diabetes Solution. We don't measure the Bauhinia, but we do mention the rotation. In fact, I had a patent years ago on rotating anorexians for the treatment of overeating. And uh, I didn't know what to do with it. I had to pay $600 to renew it every few, few years. I uh, didn't want to keep paying the 600 bucks, so I let the patent li lapse, but it's still hanging on the wall in my office. <laughs> um, next question. 47 years old, four months after getting my blood sugar controlled by low carbo, high fat diet only. Well, again, I do not favor a low carbo, high fat diet. I favor a low carb, high protein diet. If you go to a high fat diet and restrict your proteins, you're gonna get muscle breakdown and uh, uh, that's dangerous. In any event, let's see what this person is asking. I was hit by peripheral neuropathy, damage to my sensory and motor nerves. My blood flow to feet is extremely low, almost non-existent. And I wonder how the patient found this out. Uh, did, did, uh, did he have uh, Doppler studies? Uh, did they use oscillometry? Um, uh, I don't know. A1C is 5.5 a month after the pain started. What can I do? How long does it take to get blood flow back? What can I do? Um, something is missing here. Uh, this person uh, apparently had high blood sugars for many years and uh, the fact that he got his blood sugars controlled by a low carbohydrate uh, diet uh, makes me suspicious that what he calls control may not be uh, that great. Now, uh, an A1C of 5.6 is slightly elevated. I'm sorry, 5.5, an average blood sugar of about 120. Um, and, um, the circulation doesn't magically improve when you control blood sugars. Uh, it may stop getting worse, uh, but what I've, I was director of the peripheral vascular disease laboratory of a major hospital, and um, 
my best trick for improving circulation was um, uh, what I call, uh, we could call it toe presses or heel raises. Um, uh, I would have patients, uh, most of whom lived in buildings without elevators, but they had staircases, uh, step on a, uh, the edge of a step, uh, have their toes on the edge of the step, hold on to the railing, and raise their heels as high as they can, then down as low as they could, and um, uh, do that initially uh, for as many reps as they can do uh, every hour. And um, eventually, they could do more and more reps. And eventually, they could walk further and further without pain. Uh, those who have access to a gym could um, do toe presses uh, on a weightlifting machine. Um, and that was really the only thing that I uh, uh, used to improve circulation. Sometimes to get them started, I would give them L-arginine two grams a day, which would temporarily help the circulation so that they could do the exercise. Um, and uh, this, this approach worked, but they had to have normal blood sugars. If they didn't, uh, things would deteriorate. Next question, type one, three years old, diagnosed three months ago, Manage perfect blood sugars on four units lentis on your diet. Doctor wants me to have more insulin to put more weight on. Your thoughts? Um, the game plan should be to have normal blood sugars, but to put weight on, you need both protein and insulin. So you would, number one, read my book, Diabetes Solution. Number two, uh, increase dietary protein and uh, increase the mealtime insulin to cover the dietary protein. Next question. Type 1, 64-year-old female. I switched from using a Medtronic pump to Traceba insulin to hopefully gain higher control, tighter control. My A1C was 5.6 prior to switching. However, I am experiencing random heart palpitations, often waking in the middle of the night. Are palpitations a side effect of Traceba? Not to my knowledge, but if you have blood sugars that are lower than they were before, you might experience signs of hypoglycemia, even if your blood sugars are in the normal range, or even if they're uh, higher than normal, but below, significantly below what they had been before. So you get uh, a pseudo hypoglycemia because you got used to higher blood sugars. That's a real possibility. Um, the A1C was 5.6 prior to switching, which means an average blood sugar of 124. And if it came down to an average of, let's say, 83, that's enough of a drop that you could experience uh, these symptoms. Can your book be used for a newly diagnosed two-year-old child with type one? Absolutely. Uh, in fact, it's essential for the well-being of this child. Uh, kids with type 1 diabetes are usually mistreated, and um, that is medically mistreated, and uh, uh, don't fare very well. So use my book and uh, uh, let him be a survivor. Next question. Except for fresh green beans in the summer, I dislike most low-carb vegetables. Would alfalfa sprouts uh, be an acceptable substitute, like a handful on my salad each night? Absolutely, no problem whatsoever. And um, you might take a look at my book, Diabetes Solution, 
or at di my other book, Diabetes Diet, where we have a list of many vegetables uh, that are low in carbohydrate, and you might find some other ones that you might like that you've never tried before. Um, let's see. My body has plaque built up in my arteries, blockage in my carotids, my kidneys, and more. Will this way of life get rid of the blockage? I had a bad stroke 12 years ago. Well, I, I assume that this way of life is what I recommend in my book, but I'm not sure. And um, uh, to my knowledge, uh, just normalizing blood sugar may not get rid of blockages in arteries, but the, com uh, the combination of normal blood sugar and uh, strenuous exercise uh, might get rid of blockages in certain arteries, like uh, coronary arteries. Trouble is that if you already have blockages, you could kill yourself by strenuous exercise. So it has to be under the supervision of a physician and uh, done very carefully. Um, what is your recommendation on glucose levels during a high fat diet or a fast exceeding 24 hours? I, I don't understand the purpose of either. Um, a high fat, low protein diet is potentially dangerous, causes loss of muscle mass. Uh, fasts, likewise, cause simultaneous loss of both fat and muscle, but people who fast tend to regain fat uh, much more rapidly than they rebuild muscle. So I see no uh, purpose for either of these. And if this is a diabetic, I certainly don't recommend it. And to ask what is my recommendation on glucose levels, I recommend that blood sugars be normal for everybody. And since uh, uh, the literature shows that, max, that minimum mortality occurs at blood sugars around 83, uh, that's epidemi epidemiologic data, that's what I recommend for most people most of the time. Why doesn't Dr. Bernstein see children under six? Um, for a very good reason because uh, many parents insist upon having uh, an endocrinologist in addition uh, to me, and the endocrinologists frequently advocate things that are harmful for children and dangerously harmful for very small children. Things like high-carbohydrate high diets, high blood sugars, um, insulin pumps, and so on. So uh, what, you hap ha what happens, what can happen, is that um, I'm on the list of doctors for this uh, young child, uh, but the parents are following the instructions of someone else. Something terrible happens to the kid, and the lawyers come in and sue every doctor in the chart. And um, I end up getting sued for uh, something that someone else did. Uh, and since this is especially hazardous for young children, uh, uh, I have to be careful. Uh, we appreciate it's an extreme diet that we may not achieve for some time with a two-year-old but we would like the opportunity to at least try. Well, you don't need me to try it. Um, I wrote my book for people who uh, can't afford to travel to see me, who can't afford to pay medical uh, fees for the many, many hours that I spend with a new patient. So there's no reason not to use the book. My son is 50 years old and diagnosed with type 1 diabetes end of last year. He is currently on your 
low carbohydrate, high fat diet, which is not my diet. I don't advocate a high fat, I advocate high protein. And I reiterate again that avoiding the protein is a dangerous move. Um, has readings of 81 milligram per deciliter to 106. Has worried about his ketone reading of 2.7. Should this be a concern to him? No. Uh, ketones are only worth looking at if you have extremely high blood sugars and a dehydrating illness. Um, to routinely check ketones is a frivolous activity. Um, I've had diabetes 71 years, haven't checked ketones since I started monitoring my own blood sugars uh, and no longer uh, experienced ketoacidosis. And I should say, and since I went on a low carbohydrate diet. So I have no idea what my serum or urine ketones are, but again, I'm gonna be shortly, I'll be 83 years old and uh, I'm in better physical condition than people who are, than men who are 15, 20 years younger than me. And you could look at uh, videos of me exercising on uh, Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes University and you could see that uh, testing for ketones are unlikely to have been of any benefit to me. Is low carb safe for 12 year old? How many carbs a day? Well, someone earlier asked if it was low, safe for a five year old. Um, it's, uh, if, it's a t if it's a 12 year old diabetic, it's essential. And uh, you gotta read my book, Diabetes Solution. And you gotta adjust the um, amount of carbohydrate to the weight of the kid. Um, uh, we use 6 12, 12 uh, for uh, uh, adults uh, uh, weighing around 140 pounds and children get less. Can benfotiamine and maybe, uh, and I'm sorry, can benfotiamine and methyl B12 help with nerve regrowth? Um, I doubt that B12 can and um, my recollection is that benfotiamine has been used to um, slightly lower blood sugar, maybe help beta cell replication, but um, really the uh, game plan for treating diabetic neuropathies is to keep blood sugars normal. And the neuropathies do reverse with absolutely normal blood sugars but it takes time. A1C of 6.5%, that's an average of 160 milligrams per deciliter, but always feeling weak with low energy and sexual desire. My thyroid results, patient uh, tells his thyroid results, and nowhere is there an appropriate thyroid test done. As uh, as with many other physicians, this patient's physician tested everything but the right test. The most important test is the free T3, which is the active hormone, and that was not tested. Did total T3, did free T4, the TSH, all things that do not relate to symptoms. So I would suggest that um, you have your doctor check your free T3. And even if it's in the normal range, but toward the low end, um, uh, the likelihood would be that you need thyroid replacement. And that would probably be slow release liothyronine twice a day. Next question, type two for se 17 years. Now, I don't know if that's 17 years old or for 17 years on insulin some complications. Current C peptide is 0 0.6. Can that be from a fatty pancreas or just fewer beta cells? 
Well, I don't know if it's the C peptide or what, but the, to my knowledge, there's no such thing as a fatty pancreas. Uh, maybe such a thing exists and I just haven't heard of it. Uh, there is a fatty liver, um, but uh, if someone is diabetic, they have fewer beta cells. And if someone's a type two and obese, then they likely have insulin resistance in addition to fewer beta cells. I'm writing from the UK and I wondered if you had seen some research recently reported on the BBC uh, called Fasting Diet Regenerates Diabetic Pancreases. Well, if something is reported in the newspaper or on the media without a peer-reviewed article, it usually reflects uh, a need, uh, usually reflects one, lack of success and the need for funding. So I suggest you look at the video and see if they refer to any peer-reviewed article in any reputable journal. Uh, my guess is that um, uh, uh, this is uh, not a legitimate uh, ball game. Uh, it could be that it's even uh, placed by a company that's uh, trying to uh, uh, put people on some kind of regimen for which they charge a fee. When going on your diet of 50 grams carbs a day, which is not my diet, um, uh, I, the, my upper limit is 30 grams a day, I get protein in my urine along with ketones. Doctor wants me to stop the low carb diet even though my blood sugars are great. When I go to 200 grams of carbs daily, the protein disappears. Any suggestions? Well, you might read my book, but um, protein in the urine can be a lot of things. It could be due to kidney damage, uh, as I had many years ago when I was on a high carb diet. Um, or it could be due to other ailments and other factors, for example, it was recent, uh, we recently discovered uh, with the help of um, uh, hundreds of thousands of laboratory tests uh, that were gem generated by LabCorp, uh, we discovered and published that 40% uh, of women have uh, low microalbumin but high protein in their urines. And uh, the, the implication is that this protein is globulin. And why would people have globulins in their urines? Uh, it relates to something unrelated to diabetes. Um, uh, so uh, it opens up a new mystery. And um, why low carb would give you globulins in your urine uh, I don't know. Uh, this uh, certainly is strange. Uh, daughter is type 1 for 8 years. Went on your diet and her blood sugars were great. But doctor says to increase her carbs and use more insulin in order to grow. Now we're getting sugar spikes with the elevated carbs, etc., etc. Um, your suggestions. Well, it's been demonstrated in the scientific literature that kids go off their growth curve when their blood sugars are high and they go back to their original growth curve, pre-diabetic growth curve, when their blood sugars are normalized. So your doctor is telling you the opposite of what is necessary for her to grow. Um, what I try to emphasize for kids to grow is that they get uh, a lot of protein and enough insulin at their meals to keep their blood sugars normal with the additional amount of protein. And 
since most doctors don't know how much protein a kid should be getting, uh, either you should read my book, Diabetes Solution, or you should get a, a nutritionist who knows more about protein. Well, I think uh, we've finished uh, our, our teleseminar for today. Thanks for listening to our March teleseminar. Our April teleseminar will be on Wednesday, April 26th. Look forward to uh, your seeing me then. Uh, please uh, don't forget to visit uh, Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes University. And uh, if you don't have it, get my book, Diabetes Solution. See you in a month. <laughs>